Hey, well, I'm glad you could get here. It's really good to see you. We put it in. We did that piece with Russ earlier, so it was really good. And uh, welcome. Welcome very much to Conversation. A pleasure to welcome to the program, this program, uh, Gerard um, Colby. He's the president of the National Writers Union, and he's also an investigative journalism and writer, a writer, a journalist and writer. And Gerard, welcome very much. Thank We've you. done a program in the past, but it's so good to welcome you once Thank again you. to it's the program. Thank you. Great to be here. I wonder if you could, as, as our want on this series, we've got 58 minutes, and in a very real sense, I know you've got a lot of things to talk about, but it's going to be the Gerard Colby hour in a sense. So I wonder if you could uh, share your background a little bit, born and raised, that kind of thing. Well, I was born here in, uh, and raised, actually, in uh, Bayside West mm -hmm. here in, uh, in New York City and uh, went on to uh, college at uh, State University of New York. My father died, so I had a quit for a while and go to work, which was a good experience, actually, and okay. did a lot of different types of work, and uh, eventually uh, went back to college in 1966. Is that back to SUNY again? Uh, that's the first time I went to SUNY. This which, last which campus? Uh, actually, Oneonta. Oneonta, way Oneonta. upstate. Yeah, that's okay. right, way upstate. Yeah. It's very, it was, they had just moved from becoming a normal school, as they called it, for teaching teachers, yeah. to a uh, liberal arts college. Right. And I was very fortunate because some people came through that college uh -huh. uh, for other appointments, at, uh, you know, people with, with really good backgrounds, and I had the opportunity to learn an awful to lot from them. from them. Yeah, good. Okay. I started as a conservative, mm -hmm. and uh, the Vietnam War actually changed my life. Right. Then I went to work for uh, Congressman John Dow as his press secretary in 1968. John was a big supporter of Bobby Kennedy at that time. Oh, wow. Yeah, as okay. was I. And yeah. um, uh, then after uh, Kennedy's death, uh, we continued the campaign, and Unfortunately, John was running against a former commandant of the American Legion, and uh, his m I was looking into his money sources, you know, mm -hmm. for financial disclosure, mm -hmm. and that's how I stumbled on all these names out of uh, Delaware. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Giving money to this guy. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, realized that, uh, and I started looking into that, and I realized it was the DuPont family. Right. Okay. Yeah. So as uh, it's also where they all incorporate. Yeah. That's correct. That's yeah. where, and that's where everybody goes to get incorporated because the the laws are so lenient. So yeah. Uh, eventually, I I moved to Delaware after uh, finishing college mm -hmm. in 1970 and began and uh, doing research on the DuPont family and DuPont Company, and produced my first book in 1974 called DuPont Behind the Nylon Curtain. Okay. And then I uh, went could, on could, to, could to I, journalism. Could, yeah, yeah, could I ask something? You said you started out as a conservative. That's right. I hear you say. That's correct. In the Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, what was the family back? Were you politically, were you very interested or just? Oh, I was always very interested because the family was a rather political family, but my mother was a New Deal Democrat. Okay. And my dad was a uh, Lincolnian Republican, as he <laughs> used to put it. In other words, he was pro-civil rights, but... Uh, you know, it was an old moderate conservative uh, perspective inside yeah. the Republican Party, most of which now, of course, have been driven out of the Republican Party. Could that be called party. like the uh, no, uh, Rockefeller? They used to call them the Rockefeller right. There aren't any around but anymore. My brother, so. my, well, my, f my father would bristle at that because yeah. he didn't like Rockefeller too much. You oh, know, well. But, but that's the term for the moderate. Uh, as the they are now, as it's developed, yeah. yes. And yeah. uh, uh, so, you know, I would watch these arguments uh, or polite debates, but they're sometimes not so polite going Between on across your dad the, and your mother. Yeah, on the kitchen well, table. Well, at least you had a few sparks flying right, around right. the table. It wasn't right. all just talking about Bendix washing machine. You know, you're absolutely yeah. right. It yeah. was, uh, it was uh, the family. Mm. Uh, it was very important. My father, family. my mother's family was very, uh, very political too. They've been active in many meetings. Mm -hmm. So anyway, here I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got involved in journalism more in the uh, in the 70s. Uh, we wrote for the North American Newspaper Alliance, uh, did some correspondence work in South America as well as in Africa, and uh, came back, did an investigation for a magazine called In These Times, which is still publishing out of sure, Chicago, sure. on the uh, arson that was taking place along the Brooklyn waterfront, and went back to Africa to cover the... Uh, uh, the uh, a rise of uh, Robert Mugabe. Oh yeah, really? Uh, 1980. And, uh, uh, that's when they well, that's got pretty good. 80, 80, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was there for that, some of that, and uh, and then uh, I investigated the intervention by South Africa uh, shipping arms and troops 
in Rhodesian uniforms across the border. Okay, that, that's all very interesting. We we'll get to yeah. that. But back again to the education, you've gone to SUNY and then you drive and then you went back and you went to school well, where? Well, I went to Oneonta. That's where I oh, went. Oh, back to Oneonta. Yeah. To I had been at St. John's University. Now I went to Oneonta and I graduated. Yeah. That's where you took your degree in uh, journalism? Originally, it was English literature was my yeah. major, but the war changed me and I took a, uh, a degree in pre-law political science. Were you looking to do law? I was looking to do law, and I was also looking to do um, writing. I've always uh -huh. wanted to write. I've always yeah. been writing one way or the other. Yeah, you are a writer. That's yeah. correct. Uh, yeah, in, yeah, my, yeah. In, my, in my heart, I am, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, it's a great calling. I saw a thing one time. I had a friend. Uh, I don't want to get off on a sidebar and everything, but they have ways of this intelligence. They talk about intelligence or IQ or something, and they have ways of measuring it and everything. And the, the highest, the, the group, of, uh, like an occupational or activity, uh, that have the highest IQs uh, come under the rubric of writer. Really? Writers tend to have the highest IQs of the people in the American society. Well, that's, that's, so that's very <laughs> complimentary <laughs> to writers, but <laughs> there may be a lot of people that disagree. I don't no, know. I'm not so sure they do as well economically as accountants or investment bankers, but anyway. No, they don't do as well. No, I don't think no. they do. But anyway, you were there writing, and then you got into, you were in the war. War really affected Well, I didn't, you. I didn't go Vietnam in the war. war. I had a friend that came home dead from the war. Uh, I had another yeah. friend that came home with uh, missing his arm from the Dominican Republic operation. He was a Marine. Mm. And it forced me to take my politics a lot more seriously. Yeah, okay. I started to do research, and yeah. I realized, I mean, I had to do a mea culpa, really, to uh, all these people on, on campus that I'd been writing about for the war for at least a year and a half, and I had to explain I had made a terrible mistake. and. So I ran a three-part oh. series of American intervention in Vietnam, uh -huh. and uh, suddenly I was a darling of the left. But I, uh, but you uh, had written on uh, articles or pieces favoring the war effort yes, in Southeast uh, Asia. Yes, I had. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, that happens. People change, and that that's what can happen when you get uh, certain kinds of scales fall for your eyes or something like that's that. That's correct. Or well, I remember when I was on a, I was in a my last really big action was as a conservative. Uh, I had uh, been a founder, a follower of uh, Bill Buckley in those days, and yeah. uh, I was in a debate, and it was over whether or not uh, communist China should come into the United Nations, be allowed. Yeah, to that was the biggie, wasn't it? Yeah. I, uh, and I was I had just finished my comments when there was a professor from the campus, Professor Liu, who stood up and said, uh, Jerry, what's your sources on these? And I rattled off the sources, and he said, do you realize uh, that some of these are in the New York Times today? Mm -hmm. Have you read it? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I haven't read it. Uh, and he says, well, I advise you to. Mm -hmm. And what I did, mm -hmm. um, I found out that there was a big expose about CIA funding of the National Student Association uh -huh. and a long list of other foundations and groups that had gotten money from the CIA. Yeah. And there was... My, they, were, they were my sources. Those are all your sources. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! It, 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 you know, here I thought I was dealing with uh, you know yeah. independent, yeah. Uh, uh, scholarly work. Instead, yeah. I was dealing essentially with propaganda. By yeah, the agency. yeah. There's yeah. a lot of that. That's very important. There's a whole bunch of right. people in that thing. Yeah, we just did your your colleague Russ Baker, and he said that uh, a lot of the people that he was going to if you're going to try and get. White House approved sources for your getting your information. You never even bothered with. That's it. that's true. And yet that's who mostly we see on television. Well, when I I'll tell you when there was a team of us, four of us went down to the Amazon in 1976 to investigate why America's largest evangelical missionary organization called the Wycliffe Bible Translators, why they um, had learned to look the other way. How did it happen? when genocide was taking place oh. among their Indian quote-unquote wards yeah. at that time. Throughout the Amazon, about 100,000 people, um, men, women, and children, well, mostly women and children, disappeared in the Amazon, and really? indigenous people in the 60s and 70s. Disappeared? Uh, dis in other words, they died. They were oh, died by, okay. uh, and, and the range of, uh, of sources of their death that extended from, uh, from uh, diseases that had been introduced uh, to them by uh, the outside as they began to cut the Trans-Amazonian yeah, Highway, right, right, engage right. in colonization for all the people that were landless, and the indigenous people would resist that, and they would bring in these missionaries to contact yeah, them right. and live among them and bring them over, uh, and then you'd come back ten years later and find them dressed in rags 
begging along the, uh, the road. Right. So uh, this pattern. is a big issue now. Yeah, yeah so sure, it's it still is. In it's still, and it's been there for a long time, that kind of That's thing. That's true. Goes on, and yeah. we, uh, so we fit, you know, so there were four of us, like I said, and two of us uh, took the Brazilian side, and two of us took the Andean side of mm. the Amazon basin. Mm. And the idea was to meet together in Porto Vale, which is the western part of, of Brazil. Mm. Uh, then my two friends made it a terrible error when they came into Brazil. They uh, they signed up as journalists, uh, you know, when they came in for their visas. Uh, they uh, and this is the era of the dictators. And when there was the National Intelligence Service was running around uh, killing people as, mm -hmm. as death squads. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then after they registered. Uh, uh, dropped by the U.S. Embassy, did the same there, and then went on promptly to the Vias, one of the Vias Boas brothers, one of the major figures of uh, human rights for, uh -huh. in, for indigenous people in that country, mm -hmm. who was already under tremendous pressure. Well, of course, uh, their phone was immediately, immediately they started getting phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, then there was uh, someone outside starting to follow them, and finally they were shot at, and they, uh, they fled the country. Oy. They fled yeah. the country. So mm -hmm. uh, at that time, my, uh, I and my colleague, who, was, who turned out later to be my wife, uh -huh. uh, Charlotte and I literally yeah. fell in love in the Amazon. Oh, wonderful, yeah. Uh, that's what it took I'd me. make a movie, wouldn't yeah. it? It would be a great movie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so she, uh, you know, so we continued the investigation. It mm -hmm. took us uh, many, many years to discover what was really behind all this, uh, including a development process that had begun in the, 19, in the, in the uh, World War II period, uh, sponsored by the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs at that time, who was Nelson Rockefeller. Uh -huh. And there's uh -huh. a whole role of Rockefeller in the intelligence community that hardly anybody knows anything about. I, I hadn't realized that, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, so that was... It figures. It that became a book. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, it did. Uh, okay. in 19, uh -huh. Finally, we published a book in 1995 with Harper Collins, it was called uh, "Thy Will Be Done: The Conquest of the Amazon," and the subtitle was "Nelson Rockefeller and Evangelism in the Age of Oil." I think I remember that. Yes. Yeah, we talked about it in the past yeah. program. Yeah. Right, right. That's right. Yeah. So that's my uh, s story. I mean, since then we've we've done other work in journalism, uh, and finally there was a, um, a a work that came out called "Into the Buzzsaw." Uh, leading journalist exposed the myth of a free press and won the National Press Club Award. Congratulations. And, and I had a uh, lead article in that uh -huh. uh, describing my career, but others had had their careers. And how difficult it is as journalists to get stories out to the American people Yeah. and, uh, uh, and how the, there are encumbrances uh, by the corporate owners of the media. So we, uh, we described that in that book. And then I, um, for years, I've been in confronting um, Censorship, including uh, the first book I uh, had on Dupont behind the nylon curtain, which um, was the subject of threatening phone calls from Dupont Company right. to um, to Book of the Month Club to get them to drop the book in 24 hours, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, then the pressure went on to my my publisher, Prentice Hall, and they decided to kill the book privately. Uh, it's called privately publish a book instead of really publishing it. It's called privishing, mm. which uh, I've not heard that term. Yeah, yeah, which means to kill a book quietly. You cut off the life support system. You don't tell the author. Mm. You uh, cut down the print run so it can't price profitably according mm. to any conceivable formula. Mm. Uh, you cut off the advertising. You cut off the speaker's tour. You know mm -hmm. the author's tour. Yeah, all the promotion is yeah, really no, I, I the same in the film industry. I and, and I had no idea that that was going on until uh. it happened to me. And what I decided to do then, after that happened, what did was you call? What's the term? Privishing. Privish. P r i v i s h. Okay. Uh, typically, it's publishing. E yeah, that's right. Mm. And, tip and we didn't even know about this yeah. until. Uh, see, I sued D DuPont Company. Good for you, yeah. I sued Prentice Hall, mm -hmm. and uh, we found an expert witness from uh, William Decker from uh, uh, a major publishing house who testified about privishing. That's commonly done, commonly understood, mm -hmm. and it's all done quietly, and the author hasn't the slightest idea that he's been censored. Isn't that part of the business deal that's done? Because you, how much uh, you're going to get, if it's a movie or whatever, right. uh, the, the promotion budget is something that's really important. They'll be trying to say, well, we haven't got the, we can't, uh, th that's important to get that worked. You didn't have it, you were working on, you didn't have an agent or anything. I did. Out. 
I had, I had a literary agent that behind my back was, his name was Oscar Collier, it was also mm. my experience with agents, mm. uh, 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 who uh, was collaborating with, uh, with the DuPont family, mm -mm. Uh, a writer for them called a guy by the name of Mark Duke, mm. who actually knocked on my door one day and said he was working on a piece for Ramparts magazine, the Ramparts. And, yeah. uh, and gave me the name of, his, of a friend, of a mutual writer friend that uh, lived in Dover, Delaware, called my friend, he, he vouched for the guy, I opened my research files to him. Uh, later on, uh, in the course of uh, uh, discovery, you know, when you subpoena yeah. documents, uh, we found that uh, he had been a spy, literally, for the DuPont family, and uh, that he had been then went on to um, produce a book to answer mine uh, through my literary agent. About Bra Bra really? Yeah, through you my literary agent. Uh huh. And then my editor ultimately that got. That sounds like. La Carrere, La Carrere. Uh, it's, or it gets worse. My, my editor was fired, mm -hmm. uh, very good editor, and uh, he was replaced by guess who? Mm -hmm. My literary agent. I'll be damned. Oh, boy, what a book, what a movie yeah. again. We had all kinds of movies. Well, in I, life I, 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 I try to exp explain that in a 1984 uh, book called The Pond Dynasty mm -hmm. that I published, and uh, encompassing the material of the first book as well as another 300 pages. Very thick book. But in the course of, uh, of doing so, I wrote a, uh, about 30 pages on the suppression of the first edition, naming oh. names, pulling out the quote, court documents. It's an important that issue. Done. It really is, because if they don't promote it, they don't get it out there, they, sh they might as well not even bother well, with the uh, here, it out in the first place. Here I was talking, with, like with you right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. on the Financial News Network and mm -hmm. the we were talking about a number of things about the Pond Company, and uh, finally he turned and said to me, the interviewer, uh, I understand you've had trouble with the first book. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, well, let me, a matter yeah. of fact, and I turned to the book, and I mm -hmm. went to the page, six, mm -hmm. page 630, where well, it turns out page 630 to 659 were missing from mm -hmm. the book. Exactly the pages that talked about the suppression of the first book. No kidding. I got off, I, you know, I did my Jackie Gleason, went hubba hubba <laughs> hubba, and got off the, and I get on the phone, and I, I called up my, my uh, wife, uh, Charlotte, and Charlotte mm -hmm. checked, and she found out, yeah, well, we had about ten complimentary copies, and then yeah. three of them were damaged, so I, I called the literary, uh, our publisher, and the publisher that looked into it and called back and said, my God, we've discovered that about 3,500 copies of the 10,000 first print run had been damaged. I'll be damned. And that's exactly... And that same part taken out? Yes. And that's ex and he says, the only thing I can tell you, Jerry, as he looked into this, is that the, uh, the printer uh, is all s gets 80% of, of his money from Prentice Hall, who was Good the publisher group. of the first book. I'll be dead. So um, uh, he's dead now, the publisher, um, and uh, th we never got that book out. Uh, we it couldn't price profitably. It was exactly right. what they did with the first book, right, cut right. the print run down by right. about one-third. Uh -huh. And so um, uh, that's the end of that story, although I haven't finished doing my research on the DuPont people, and mm -hmm. I anticipate that I will be coming back. Well, that's really book. interesting because uh, if, you, if you have such a thing going, because it's hard enough to get something out or something learn something or know something, but then if it's going to be sabotaged in the way in which it can be distributed, you might as well not even have done all that work because it's not going to affect anything. Well, when uh, I went in a way, that's a... That, that's one of the issues, yeah. Harold, that I, I dealt with I, and when I went to court. Yeah. And um, we spent eight years in federal court. Really? And uh, we won against Prentice Hall uh, in the U.S. District Court, Southern District Court here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we were reversed uh, in uh, the appeals court, they did not find an error of standard of law. They uh, did not find an error of fact. They s the uh, the decision was written by a uh, uh, by uh, a judge by the name of Ralph Winter, and he simply said that this book could not have ever gotten off, even though it was it had a two page uh, Sunday edition, New York Times. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Very praising. Uh, really? Okay. Uh, and it had been taken off as one of the top 50 books in, in the United States. Wow. But, By but the Times? New York yeah, Times? Yeah. But wow. they But they couldn't, uh, Prentice Hall could not fill the orders because they had cut the print run. Yeah. So the book died. So um, we made all that argument in court, uh, but the appellate judge didn't, and his panel didn't want to hear it. And it turns out this judge had sat 
uh, as a uh, uh, all I can tell you is that he uh, had sat as a uh, as a clerk to a judge uh, who had just been named in Delaware for suppressing asbestos poisoning wow. of DuPont workers oh. and uh, you would think maybe he would recuse himself oh. or no so that uh, we then at that point Larry Tribe of Harvard yes, of course. stepped yeah. in and said this is a violation of uh, this is the First Amendment issue because they this is now entirely different. The uh, the court is declaring that this book, for the conservative political perspective of this judge, right. uh, could not have taken off, and therefore is throwing out all the evidence, the facts, and the and the finding of the of, of the lower court. And they we appealed to the Supreme Court with the ACLU. Were they were they accepted? Or they no? didn't accept no. it. No. And that's they the Rehnquist Court. Yeah, you know, right. it's very tough to get anything through. Yeah. It still is. Yeah. So we, um, I at that point by then I That's learned. It's very disquieting. Well, I learned I mean, my yeah, yeah, sure it is. Uh, you know, and we find this happens a lot. So <coughs> really, you do. Well, you got yeah. other people yes. you run into. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. how in 1981, mm -hmm. even before the decision had come down, mm -hmm. um, many of us who are writers, uh, yeah. written for Nation, and others, who all yeah. we all came together at something called the American Writers Congress. Uh huh. We expected eighty one. Did you say eighty one? Okay, yeah. We expected only maybe uh, you know f maybe four or five hundred people would show up, writers. Yeah. Instead, five thousand showed up. Well, wow. three thousand. Three thousand wow. showed up. And uh, as we all started to compare notes mm -hmm. in our workshops and so on, we realized more and more that what we thought were individual problems yeah. were really problems endemic to the publishing industry, Ooh, including yeah. the you know the censorship that was seemed to be growing as a result of or as consolidation took it, more and more place. It wasn't just follow-ups or bureaucratic no, follow-ups. No, no. They didn't push the right, uh, you no. know, no. commands uh, to the computer. So no, it no. was, uh, this is a deliberate intervention. And uh, what we also find out that, uh, well, this is, you know, this is the Reagan era, Cold War yeah, and everything. Right, right, right. So we, um, we also found out that there seemed to be a, a, a more and more of an effort to use privishing techniques yeah. for uh, economic reasons, not okay. just political reasons, yeah. uh, so that they would break break the contract. Now, why would they break and breach a contract with an author, and then keep it quiet and secret? Have something to do with money? Yeah, it always had something to do with <laughs> money. So <laughs> what it really came down to is that uh, they um, uh, publishers very. Uh, Let's put it this way. I remember the old days when you would walk down the aisles of a publishing house and you'd see editors doing what they are supposed to do, which is edit. Uh -huh. Today you walk down the aisles and it's not uncommon to see the editors watching television to pick out the latest celebrity they uh -huh. can run a book on. I'll be, yeah, and, okay. the, uh, and the point about this is that as publishing houses have gotten larger, yeah. as the one of the... As the mergers take place, as these corporate giants begin to emerge, right. and as even non-publishing companies take them over and uh, squeeze them for whatever profit they get, the pressure is on the publisher to produce a higher yield, in other words, a higher uh, rate of return for profit. Uh, 8 to 10, 12 percent was considered a very good year in publishing yeah. in the old days. Today, uh, 20 to 30 percent is the expectation, Twenty per, uh, uh, 30 percent profit, a yield. And yeah, that's a pretty high order. That's very yeah, high, but no. that's what they're getting in cable television, and the conglomerates expect that. They're getting that in cable yes. television. Yes. So the now? pressure comes down now, uh -huh. comes down on the editors, and it used to be that the editors were like in the. We used to have a, a term inside the industry: the editors are the saints, um, yeah. uh, or the church, yeah. and the um, uh, uh, the the warriors were actually the uh, the bean counters, you mm -hmm. know, the guys and the. Yeah. Uh, they control the money, and um, but it's clear that the more and more the uh, bean counters have had more and more of a say inside publishing and what gets published and what doesn't, huh. and how fast. And then you got to consider this: your lifespan on a bookshelf mm -hmm. is only about uh, six weeks now, on a, on a common bookstore. Uh, if you do not move that that book very well in you the first six numbers, weeks. Yeah. Uh, it gets yanked, uh -huh. and it gets put in the back, and all the books that may be in your in the boxes that are not sold are sent back to the publisher. Rendered, or and uh, well, then the publisher can use them to you would think to fill back orders. Yeah. Uh, no, more and more, what they're doing is they're closing up the boxes, or not, not in many cases, not even bother opening them up, 
because uh, they're moving on to the next title. Mm. And instead, they're sending them out to warehouses where they're being burned. I'll be damned. No. And uh, I know that HarperCollins They're Collins not even being recycled. No. And HarperCollins They could at least recycle. HarperCollins has a uh, huge crematoria, crematorium, crematorium for books yeah. out in the Midwest. Uh. Uh, and so this is, a, this is getting more and more serious for writers as they get pushed aside by the celebrities because yeah. that's the big attraction. You know, that's going to yeah. get the money, they think. I heard, I heard you mention cable television and it could be movies. I wonder if it's systemic because I know Ben Bagdickian used to write beautiful... Well, we follow things for cable television particularly mm -hmm. in public access, but he wrote about the media... Mon uh, and it used to be... Uh, I'm in that book, in, in his book. Are the you media, really? The Media Monopoly. Great book. guy. And yeah, he, he wrote it were 55 major things. There was some real competition. There was some real things... And it's down to about five now, yeah. major corporations. Right. And when you get into those things, you get some economies of scale, they can argue and that kind of thing. But you don't have the same kind of attention to the things that really matter to the writers or to the to producers or the relationship. That relationship between the creative people and the bean counters, as right. you put it, right. is one that's really important to focus on, is yeah. it not? Yeah, it is, it is. And you've got is. this union that you're the president. Well, the, uh, that's what I learned. I, I learned that all, uh, from my court case and my battle for eight years that um, in a lone individual doesn't stand much of a chance. Uh, uh, against things that, happen yeah. against, and power relations occur in courts all the time. Yes, of course. That's Politi what very political. That's what people don't realize. They think that uh, this is a nation of laws. In many cases it is, and in many cases it is not. Yeah. And and power like relations are confronted or threatened in any way. Uh, it's amazing how these judges come What about the trend in that, about the relationship with the power and the relationship? I, don't think, I think it's getting worse. I mean, that's, okay. And that's what eventually led uh, a lot of us coming out of the 1980s one American yeah. Writers Congress to form the National Writers Union, okay. which is why we're part of the United Auto Workers now, okay. our parent union, their technical and professional division, mm -hmm. and our title, our local number is 1981. Okay, 1981, yeah, that's right. That's good, yeah. That's to show our the origins. Data, yeah. So, the, you know, w National Writers Union uh, is the only union in the United States that represents um, the interests of uh, freelance writers of all kinds. So freelance that writers and producers of media? Does no, it involve just, just writers? Just, just writers. Okay, okay. Um, so freelance uh, uh, journalists, freelance book writers, and freelance technical uh, and business writers. Okay. And um, we have three divisions representing them, mm -hmm. and um, they come together every two years to work out what the legislative or uh, programmatic uh, 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 agenda or initiative should be for the union. Mm -hmm. And that uh, then is turned over when it's passed by them. It's turned over to the National Executive Committee to execute that. Uh -huh. And um, and the president uh, presides over the National Executive Committee. The major issues that are really confronting freelance journalists now is, 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 is uh, survival. Uh -huh. um, not only are newspapers in that trouble, but, you know, you've got 30,000 freelance journalists Ha were let go or have been laid off uh, since uh, since 2001. Wait a minute, laid off by whom? A freelance by companies. would be somebody. No, not only freelance journalists. Okay, I meant yeah. they were staff journalists, and they're okay. and they've been axed, yeah. and now they've become freelance journalists right. as a result to try yeah. to stay in the industry. Yeah. So much so that the Newspaper Guild actually amended their bylaws to establish a freelance small division to try to hold on to them. Who, who, who abandoned the bylaws? Uh, actually, it was Linda Foley. She was president yeah, of the I Newspaper Guild. I don't know the Newspaper Guild. That's, a, uh, That's the people in the industry. Staff people, yeah. uh, staff writers, staff journalists. And uh, we represent the freelancers on that side. I see, right. They, they, they have a, you can be a freelancer, then they have stringers who have a certain kind of relationship with, right, a, right. Uh, with a distribution company right. or something. Right. So I don't understand all well, the nuances. Well, it depends. Of that. If a stringer is on salary, then he is really working for them. Right. Uh, and isn't a freelancer as such. Mm. But if he's. Freelancer is like a. In, in business for himself, essentially. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, uh -huh. But there's a problem there because yeah, sure. the reality, of course, is that you know, you're effectively a, are an employee of your publisher and of your company. They will essentially lay out the facts and lay out the terms of contracts. If you don't know what your rights are and mm -hmm. if you don't belong to an organization uh, representing many thousands so that people... Uh, when they're negotiating with you, when publishers negotiating with you, they yeah. realize that you're not speaking just for yourself, but for many other people that are yeah, backing you. Yeah, in solidarity. That's right. Yeah. Then um, you're in trouble. You're you're the lone uh, David against the the Goliath. Yeah. Uh, 
So um, and they can write anything they want. Well, as a matter of fact, they have. What we, for instance, what they were doing for years, and they still are. Uh, when you wrote a piece, an article, or or, or uh, something, and it, and it ended up on the internet, mm -hmm. um, you thought that was it. You know, you mm -hmm. thought you would sell them first, first the North American print rights, which was the common, and anything else they had to pay extra the publisher for yeah, that. And that's yeah. how freelancers make a living. Right. They break their copyright down to different rights and sell those rights. So it could be geographic rights, uh -huh. it could be language rights, it could be format rights, uh, and there are subsidiary rights, dramatic, and, and um, but there are also, uh, you know, uh, uh, t uh, readers, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, audio books that are put out and so on, things mm. like that, and movie rights. Mm. So all of that um, uh, is how you make a living as a journalist. You, that's why you have to know about your copyright mm. law. You have to know what your rights are. You know, have to know how to bargain on these things. And very the often, people who are really creative or even high intelligence have a, not a very good tolerance for the business That's end. right. So uh, they're like... Um, Babes in the woods. Well, yeah, babes in the wood or fodder. And you and you really yeah. need somebody like a union or like a, a good literary agency yeah. to defend your interests. Yeah. The literary agency system doesn't serve well enough to freelancers. And well, the problem with literary yeah. agents, and I have a lot of them are good friends, and the, most of them are good. Are they? Okay. That's most of them are good. But the reality is that, uh, no, I mean, most of them are try to, uh, try to in do good faith performance right, of okay, their yeah, responsibilities. Right, yeah. There are some that, are, that don't, mm -hmm. and they make a bad name for everybody, but uh, most of them are okay. But uh, the question is, uh, how often can they go back to, this, to the publisher and make strong demands with the publisher when they ha know that they're going to have to go back to the same publisher with another contract for another contract for another book. Right. So right. there's a bit of a bit of compromise. I, I wonder have. if that applies to the economy as a whole or not. Well, to a degree it does. Uh -huh. um, but the question is that they get their they actually you would think they get their money from their from the from the writer. They get a, a commission. Yeah. Can it be anywhere from ten? percent as it was when I started mm -hmm. to now today 20 percent okay. of all advances and so on and all kind of income that comes in for that contract. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know, there's, there's some that feel too compromised and will cut the deal like Oscar Collier clearly did with Prentice Hall uh, when he was know. representing my book. Oh, oh yeah, Bob. right. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, uh, so having an outside force that's controlled by writers mm -hmm. And who can actually set up, uh, for instance, we have a grievance and contract division where we have trained contract advisors uh, that will help you and take you through the negotiations with the publishing company. And then if there's a problem after that occurs, uh -huh. uh, say they don't pay you the royalties on time, which is not uncommon, mm -hmm. or say there's some other responsibility under the contract they didn't carry out, we have trained grievance officers okay. who will then intervene for you and help you in your uh, in your confrontation with the uh, publishing company to come around. We've won over one point nine million dollars for our members. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. That way, and do you uh, have to go. Do you have to do court action, or is there something? Uh, sometimes or? we tend n we go right before court, uh -huh. and we yeah. tend not to get involved in a case that obviously that already has legal legal representation. Mm. Um, but if the and and then many people then not many but some people feel that they can go on to court. But let me tell you this: yeah, if there's it's an expensive for one thing. Now let me get mm -hmm. back to the internet issue. Yeah, um, we have all these these articles being written, and what we found out is that the companies, the publishing companies, were reselling the articles to database companies on the internet, who in turn were selling them to researchers at libraries or students at libraries so without. or consumers. So the product is out. And without any compensation, compensation to, the, for, writers, to yeah. the copyright holder, the, the writers. To the one who produced the work in That's the first right. place. That's right, yeah. the original creator. So they're, they're, um, uh, we realized that this was very serious, so we try to get them to change their policies, and it's very clear they were moving in that direction. The publishing the houses didn't want to hear it. Yeah, the yeah. technology is moving that. Well, way. that's right. The technology, the technology is there, you know. But there, the technology also would allow them to um, identify when the when an article is, for instance, being sold, 
and to uh, have a commission on that, just like in the mu music industry. They got ASCAP. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're trying to set up the same thing right now. There's not been anything like nothing that in like the history that. of the scribbling no. class? No. Is Mr. Baker used nothing, to say? Nothing, nothing at all for mm. writers. Mm. And uh, we're now in the process through a number of court cases and suits. Uh, writers are finally putting it to pieces together for making that happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we went, we fought this right up to the Supreme Court about these, we call it a rights grab, you know, and we call the people that are in, infringe copyright, um, which is our livelihood, um, pirates. Uh -huh. They're pirates. They're, they're, so we uh, took them to the Supreme Court and won. The Supreme Court of New York? The United States. United States. Right. 19, uh, that's right, 2001 came the decision is Tassini versus the New York Times. Wow. New York Times was among those companies that was involved in this, but there was a whole slew yeah. uh, and that were defendants, and um, we won. And uh, Wow. And then the next question is, what happens? No. Well, do they come to terms? They have compensation they have to pay. Right. They also, if they willfully did this, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't be involved or exposed to punitive yeah, damages. Yeah, you could be criminal. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the statute is very clear in the Copyright Act that you could be uh, hit with a huge fine. Mm -hmm. Well, what the publishers did is did they did an end run oh. around the Supreme Court decision. And they started to impose something that was introduced in the... Uh, in the 90s called the all rights contract. Mm -hmm. So typically in the internet, if you uh, want to sell many rights, um, now they put all those rights together into the contract and they say, um, you are surrendering or licensing the, the use of this uh, book uh, forever uh, in, in throughout the universe in mm -hmm. all in formats <laughs> yet to be invented mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. you know this is a, an outrage yeah. and uh, but they're getting away with it because they can impose it they could say if you want to get published this is what you have to do yeah, that's right it's or take a walk mm -hmm. so we um, buyer's marker so there some uh, reporters uh, confronted this for instance by the Boston Globe which yeah. really has a dominant position in the b freelance market in in the Boston area um, decided to sue, and unfortunately, they took their case to Massachusetts State Court, and uh, New York Times lawyers, who New York Times controls the Boston Globe, came I up didn't know. Okay, and yeah. defended the, yeah. the uh, company, and um, and turned around and and you know actually we we consider this a violation of also the Constitution. The Constitution has a clause, the copyright clause, that makes it very clear that uh, that. Uh, this that your copyright is controlled and protected by the by the Constitution of the United States yeah. that because they understood the founding fathers that a, the cultural reproduction and growth of a nation depends upon its artists its writers being able its inventors too and mm -hmm. being able to hold on to an ex uh, for a limited time a limited period of time an exclusivity over the over the use of this work that they've created. Right. And in, in inventors, it's the patent office for writers and artists. It's copyright. So we um, we saw this as this is undermining the Constitution. So the problem is, I said uh, they went into Massachusetts State Court, and the judge there was very sympathetic to the arguments, and he turned to the New York Times lawyers and said, "Look, I know what you're trying to do." You are trying to go do an end run around the Tassini decision, uh -huh. uh, so but, unf but unfortunately, there's nothing. He turned to the def uh, uh, to the rise and said, "There's yeah. nothing I can do for you because Massachusetts allows contracts of adhesion, hmm. which are take it or leave it contracts. Some states don't allow that; they have to be negotiated. But that's essentially what they did. I thought that case should have been in federal court because rather than state court, because clearly." Uh, uh, the interstate commerce was involved. Yeah. Uh, they don't only just sell the Boston Globe in Massachusetts and yeah. throughout that region. And on top of that, uh, there was an antitrust issue here about the New York Times using the Boston Globe's domination right. of the freelance market yeah. to impose uh, uh, prices. It's very complicated for, for services and goods. It's very complicated. It has a template kind of pattern for the society. It lies the ways in which the big uh, people right. can get around. Right. Right. That Supreme Court decision came down in your uh, favor had right. no effect in the end? Or what? In the end, it had no effect. Well, congratulations on the Pyrrhic victory. Yeah, you know? well, mm. what we're now doing is trying to ch confront that and challenge it in different ways. And um, there obviously is going to have to be some sort of litigation to deal with this. We want enforcement 
of copyright. And one of the things that, for instance, that is on our agenda uh, in the new administration is to get the Justice Department to expand its anti-piracy task force, which was set up to deal with corporate rip-offs uh, in the music industry yeah. against right, uh, yeah. music composers. A lot of that so I on. hear from a lot of my musician friends. Is so it, they have a jungle. Yeah. They have now a, uh, a task force going after the the, uh, the infringers, the pirates. Uh -huh. But they don't have anything for literary works, so we want that expanded to include literary works so we can have enforcement of the law. What's the prognostication in that regard? As I know, yeah, as we, whatever you can read from the Obama With the new administration, the only thing I'd say is Obama's a writer. Mm -hmm. you know? He understands. He did write a couple books that did yes, him very he did. well. That's right. And he knows how. They were very successful because it was That's political. right. If so he hadn't become president or in that political he might have they a would not. Yeah. Have, well, yeah, but they would not probably have become as professionally yeah. lucrative yeah, and yeah. Uh, probably. influential. Yeah, it's probably yeah. true. So is a celebrity writer. So a celebrity, I heard you using the term celebrity easy, right. that the people are instead of reading, they're doing their work, they're looking at celebrity. There's a, there's a, there's a overweening interest in the celebrity yeah. uh, culture That's right. by the people in the right. what right. should be the intellectual realm of writing yeah. with all those people that well, the collectively have the, the highest IQ ratio of any member of our society. Well, one of the big problems. Somebody ought to be protecting the bright one. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say that everybody that's blonde is dumb because uh, there's some, you know, I've, for instance, I, there's a, uh, a songwriter mm. who published some poetry uh, that was quite stunning, I thought. And all I'm saying is that other book writers, the mid mid-list books, which provide the meat and potatoes yeah. of the industry, mm -hmm. uh, should have their rights protected, and they shouldn't have their 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 um, in this, the investment that a publisher is supposed to make for them mm -hmm. under the law. Uh -huh. You know, you know, when you publish a book, it's not just printing it. Right. You're supposed to promote it. Yeah, absolutely. And well, uh, this, isn't it the same with the movie or with the television or with? Well, the it depends on the thing? contract, but there's, yeah, yeah, there no, is there is a I standard mean, in the no, industry. No, but I mean, in terms of generic, I mean, it's the thing. It's the creative community versus the bean counters. That's in pretty way. much it. But and but uh, but behind the bean counters are the big guys that own the corporations okay, yeah, that's right. who are insisting on higher rates of return. Mm -hmm. and, they, and what's driving that also well, is... Well, that's the, been going particularly gro grossly in this last year when we've been in the thrall of the neocons well, and the true. Friedmanites that's and all that kind of thing. So maybe there's a better... Maybe there'll be change. ...better wins ahead. Wait, well, Although it's, uh, it's also largely induced to a large part by the technological well, well, march I'll of history. I'll give you another problem. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the other problem is uh, right now there, there was a bill introduced last year, the year before, um, and uh, will probably be introduced this year, um, called the Orphan Works Act. Now, the Orphan Works Act it orphan? says... Orphan? What orphan. What they say, essentially... Little orphan yeah. yeah, okay, orphan. Now, remember I told you... Orphan to the, Works, I like that, yeah. What I, remember <laughs> when I told you I went to the Amazon? Yeah. And, well, I went, when, during the Amazon, I was doing an investigation to genocide. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to announce myself. As a matter of fact, I had to go in camera in many situations. Mm -hmm. I'd be talking to the uh, generals in the day, and I'd be talking to the people that are hunting at night. Yeah. So um, I had to be very careful about contacting my literary agent, if at all, uh, sending my records out of the country as I finish them. Uh, and um, and you know not really making much contact with uh, well back in the states at that time I came out of the jungle six months later mm. with my story, but Shaw and I did. But uh, <coughs> the issue here is that under the or new Orphan Works Act that's being proposed, mm -hmm. uh, a company if they find that they can't say they're interested in your book, they can't find you. Mm -hmm. You're in you're doing an investigation or God knows what. Yeah, yeah. Um, they can just, after a so-called due diligence search, which they do not define, mm -hmm. uh, they do not have standards, mm -hmm. uh, they can declare the book usable. Uh -uh. Grab it and use it. And, and then when you come out mm -hmm. and say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? And you insist that they take it down from their websites or stop the printing, mm -hmm. order, they can charge you with their expenses. Good God this Almighty. This is all in this act. And you know who's promoting it? No. It's pro being promoted by the U.S. Uh, Copyright Office. But the real character inside the U.S. Copyright Office that's been promoting this is the general counsel, or ha up until recently, general counsel. What is that telling us about society? Well, you, what you do is you look into the general counsel and his background, and that tells you a lot. Okay. And... Um, um, what was he? What, what, he worked. For, uh, he was a he was a lawyer for uh, entertainment companies out in, uh, and he was a, out of Stanford. You know, entertainment companies, Hollywood companies, and Hollywood is the one that wants this. 
And they want this so that they could get options without getting the options. They the essentially writer. want copyrighted works uh, to be pushed Available into the them. public domain that they can grab. Yeah, right. And when well, that's because the whole media is uh, shifting. Mr. Money. McClure, well, m yeah, but Mr. McLuhan also used to tell us that we're coming into the electronic age instead of the literate age and that kind of thing. So. Um, Everything's going multimedia. Well, it's just who controls the media, and they don't have yeah. any respect for people's rights except for making their money. I'm not saying all companies, but clearly these people are pushing it. And this this is the U.S. this U.S. copyright uh, 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 um, general counsel, office general counsel, was a guy that uh, worked for the entertainment industry and uh, is promoting this. And uh, matter of fact, he's coming up to uh, Columbia University in, in a week or so. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm going to be there okay, you know, with yeah. others to, you know, to challenge him on mm. his positions. Mm. Uh, now, the entertainment industry... A little industry, conflict of interest, I thought. Yeah, the inter uh, entertainment, uh, info, they got a term in television, infotainment, where you're just getting things. And that, that's the kind of thing, entertainment. Uh, there's also published... Things can be entertaining, but then there are things that are real serious or something like that. It's serious mm -hmm. work. Entertaining is a little bit demeaning in terms of it, in terms of it. But, I mean, in, in, in information terms, I mean, there are documentaries that are done, multi I think multimedia, that kind of thing, that are very serious, educational, and so forth. But when a new medium comes along, it becomes the, the, old, con the old medium becomes the content of a new one, and here we're coming into an age of multimedia, and now when you get the internet coming, where you can stream things and you can have a swimming in bandwidth and so forth, the literary tradition of writing is coming under challenge. Do you think? Well, I think it's also a by the multimedia, and also by the kind of uh, a school system that uh, has not yet confronted seriously the damage that's being done by this to the educational process okay. of the citizenry, that's the young citizens. That's a bigger citizens. social issue, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you got these kids that are watching television for two, three, four hours a day mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, reading, and uh, they don't read. As a matter of fact, newspapers are dying. They, they turn on the Internet or they turn on the television. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fact that the, you'll get sound bites, but you're not going to get the in-depth analysis well, that, that there's you need. A, there's, a, there's a prejudice there, or there is a thing about that, like McLuhan again. You would, I used to stu or visit with him every spring and everything like that. I read that Gutenberg Galaxy was in Tour de Force, and he was saying it's coming, and television... Watching television isn't um, necessarily only entertainment, although it has, an, it has a tendency toward that. I think it can but be a people very... But people like us, we yeah. think in terms of the linear thinking and the well-phrased sentence and the, liter the literary... And he said the medium is the message. And more important than the message is the medium by which things are being conveyed. And it seems to be it's a relentless thing. We're going to have unlimited band. We're going to have holography soon. Whoa. We're going to have unlimited bandwidth, which we've never had. And we're coming into an electronic age of information, well, including multimedia. But it could be very liberating, too. I yeah, mean, that's for what instance, I'm thinking. It might like, be like uh, a silver, uh, silver lining. How much somewhere. more information can you get through the Internet? It's extraordinary how much time is saved for researchers of books when they can get this information, then if they get, then they follow it up in corroboration. Mm. But if uh, but there's a lot of people that do not corroborate. You know, right. they just yeah. take whatever they want to say over the internet, yeah. and it's a free speech issue there too, uh, that can't be trampled on. Yeah. But but to make the distinction between someone who is just engaging in free speech and someone who is actually doing a professional job yeah. of, of bringing you news and analysis. Mm. Uh, is something that has to be worked out. Uh, oh. Bloggers, for instance, now do have at least one. Oh. Chris Kraft's son is now a. Um, Chris Kraft was a AP okay. correspondent yeah. up in Vermont, uh -huh. and uh, who I met a few times. And his mm. his kid got credentials at the White House <coughs> uh, as a blogger. Mm -hmm. His son, I shouldn't call him a kid, but mm. uh, I know what you mean. <laughs> Everyone's a kid to me anymore, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, mm. what we need mm. is, is young people coming into the National Writers Union and into other organizations. Yeah. They don't now because they have a tendency not to join anything other than social networks. Yeah. Um, and I hate to say it, but probably because they have not been confronted 
with the real world. When they go out and get jobs, however, uh -huh. and they and we see them, they come to us. Can you help us in this? Can you help us in that? Uh, they're they're in desperate straits. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. so that's where. Um, my members of the National Writers Union, mm. who are uh, on India's, yeah. some of them, yeah. are now uh, realizing that they have to really turn the reins over to young people. Yeah, but they ought to bring them in, but they ought to bring a new, uh, a new sense of solidarity. And so, how many are in there uh, in the union in that, or can you count well or not? Or how many affiliates are with it? How much support is there in the intellectual community for the work you're doing? We have and a recognition lot of, of the importance of it. A lot of support uh, in inside the uh, inside the intellectual and literary community. Yeah. Very strong support. They have a group uh, pen or something. Good repute and pen yeah. and recognizes us. I mean, I get invited to their to their uh, some of their strategy yeah. sessions about trying to meet Solomon health insurer insurance and so on. Yeah, so okay. yeah, we were supportive yeah. of. We yeah. went to uh, you know we supported Rushdie when his life was threatened. Yeah. But you know yeah. behind all this is really that uh, uh, is the fact that. There is, and I think the, this Obama administration is going to is we're seeing this happen now. Mm. It's a confrontation over the direction of the country between those who have run it for a long time yeah. and liked what it was going and drove it right into the ground. Uh -huh. As long as they got their fifth home and you know all the vacation and putting money away for their kids and living the good life, the they were looking the other maybe way. Maybe the intelligent class. Maybe. Uh, well, I hate to tell Is you, but a lot of these people, the, as intelligent as they are. Uh, was quite capable of being uh, corrupted. No, no, but I meant the, they're good, there's this group that's running the thing in the ground using the old thing, and that was confronting against who? Obama representing, will there be a better, representing will there the be people. a better milieu for in to, the intellectual so. community to have a say over things? I would hope so, I would hope so. I think they would, we would hope also that the American people as a whole would yeah, have more okay, of a say. Yeah. And uh, well, the intellectuals could, you know, maybe uh, speak up more and and feel less intimidated. Um, we and know they might that be able to come up with some answers because I don't think your political class, your traditional political class, and that kind of thing, have come up with the adequate kind of patterns for a world-changing situation where there's a tr the old system is being challenged. They haven't come up with an alternative, right. and that coming up with the alternative outside the envelope thinking is from the intellectual community, and the intellectual community has not been free enough or able to bring ideas that are relevant to the future rather than reify all the old outdated institutions and there should be a context where they can come mm. into more I think relevance in terms of the way society is organized. I think there's a real chance that the Obama administration Hope will so. open that up but it's going to be a fight. He have all the meat mar markings it's of the class act. He, uh, he does yeah. and he uh, is confronting right off the ground. He conf one of the first things he signed was uh, removing the Bush uh, restrictions on the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, that's good. Very crucial yeah, for journalism. And the, and the ethics. The you ethics know, and the, it's right, and, and the, the uh, and, and the then closing the CIA, uh, uh, you know, in the process of that, the closing the CIA's secret prisons. Those all are over all the good world. signs, if you yeah. ask me. They are, and, and they're very also brave. the very first thing that came out was to investigate these atomic uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction because those systems are now species lethal. Yeah. And they're still bouncing around, and we've got a situation where we can wipe out the whole bloody That's species right, if right. we go down the old We're track. talking about thousands upon thousands of warheads still in the hands yeah. of the United States and Russia. And that was the first thing he announced. Yeah. I mean, he's been talking to Mr. Uh, Nunn and so forth, and that's Sam good. Nunn. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so there's good signs. Well, there are good signs. But it but may be a, an environment, instead of stifling the intellectual community and fighting with there might be a, a general movement where we the would intellectual hope. community but is I don't able think to come forth with I don't ideas. Think it's, I don't think that's going to happen unless people actually take the initiative themselves. Okay. Don't wait for the politicians to do that. And right. uh, Obama, if he's going to succeed, he's yeah. going to need the support of people. And frankly, somebody's got to keep their feet that's to the how fire. He, that's how yeah. he got into power. Yeah. He got into power because he was one of those that was willing to think outside the box yeah. and talk directly to the issues. And people saw how he's frank. Tax, he's tax tech savvy. And, uh, and that's important. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. the other part of it is that mm. he's not really an elitist. You know, mm. he's not. And he understands the connection between a society capable culturally of reproducing itself and mm -hmm. growing yeah. and the role of the common people to make that happen. Yeah. And um, so 
that's all good. Yeah. But that does not mean the corporations are through. Mm. And the Orphan Works Act, or I the, expect, on the, the table again. You'd call that yeah. the Ajah regime. Yeah. That's right, the ancient you, regime. Yes. You know, they were in yeah. place for 5,000 years after Rome. Yeah. yeah. And they just thought yeah. that they were legitimate. They had the legit. Anybody questioning the thing, you're going to have to a system that's going to be, be able to compromise, to appropriately uh, subsume the outdated institutional thinking and so forth, but have it in a way where they'll be able to understand it in the end and go along with it. So it's beyond a dialectic, I think, if we're going to avoid yeah. wiping out our species. Yeah, yeah. That's the job for the intellectual class. The way should be cleared for them to be able to come forth in a way that can uh, well, uh, can uh, encourage the intellectual uh, oddly efforts enough, and uh, not discourage them. Oddly enough. And uh, your union is very important in your yes, work, and uh, I congratulate you on it very but, much. But, you know, oddly enough, we, we it's and not oddly enough, actually, it's uh, too often it's catastrophe that opens the doors to get pe and opening minds to question. For instance, I was at a, a meeting of the museum at the Museum of uh, um, uh, telev uh, Radio and Television yeah. right here in, yeah. in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. There were about 30 organizations that were invited to uh, come together and talk about the state of the media. Yeah, and, important. Uh, yeah. And there was people like Dave Marish was there. Yeah. Um, uh, the head of the International Federation of Journalists was there. Aiden White and a couple of people that were anchors and so on and they revealed that they had been told during the Iraq war for instance not to really report about what they were seeing my god uh, that they would the kind of, they, the the uh, producer the guys on the top not the producers but the owners were frightened that they would be declared uh, unpatriotic yeah right sure they put that so they gave in yeah sure. they gave in and they put the, they put the lid on the on the, and the and so the reporters were not able really to do their jobs right. you know what opened it all up what katrina all right that's interesting that's the disaster of katrina yeah. and oh, the lack of response and finally you know bush couldn't deny what was going on and no. katrina even though he brings black wa uh, black water uh, yeah, guards, yeah, yeah. Uh, mercenaries back like to patrol the streets like the of New Orleans, I was like watching. It's yeah. like watching the the mercenaries of Rome come back from the colonies yeah, to right. march down Rome. Yeah. So you know, so he couldn't he couldn't deny that anymore. It opened up a window of opportunity, and there everybody was saying, "Now we can get the stories out," and that's well, what they did. Well, let's hope that we got an opportunity that's coming. We're only a couple of days into the new administration. Better give them some back. But I know one thing that's going to help him maybe find his way is the work of the National Writers Union you've had a hand and all the work that went before that. Glad you made that conversion back there when you were a conservative <laughs> because I think you've joined into it. But a I always rank. wanted to be a writer. So. All right. <laughs> well, writers have the best in touch. So good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gerard. Ver Gerard Colby, then, uh, <clears throat> president of the National Writers Union and a writer and investigative journalist doing the work of uh, helping to free up the intellectual creativity and survival of the uh, of the scribbling or the intellectual class, which is really called for in terms of the evolution of consciousness. Thanks a lot for all that good work. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Maybe you could think about coming over here and becoming a producer. Maybe a <laughs> television. You don't we'll have see. an animus against multimedia. Oh no! Well, actually, I, I, because I had your a, works apply to all the creative. We had a uh, we yeah. had a, a public access uh, TV show for five years. In, Did you hear? In Vermont. Oh, in Vermont. Yeah. Well, you might think about coming and joining. It's become faculty over here. So, because uh, this is going to be streamed to the whole world, you understand, yeah. and it's going to be up on YouTube by tomorrow.